Hello, everyone, um, and welcome to our third panel of um, narrating Cold War's conference. Now, panel is titled Transnational Art and Cultural Dip Diplomacy. My name is Matea Kovacic. I'm assistant professor at um, School of Communication and Film, Academy of Film, Hong Kong Baptist University. And it's great to be here as your um, chair. And we have five exciting speakers um, who will present for around 15 minutes each. And we will have a Q&A afterwards with what I'm sure are great questions from the audience. I will introduce each speaker before their uh, presentation. And I'm very happy to announce our first speaker today, who is Eleni Sideri, social anthropologist uh, specializing in the ethnographies of the Black Sea, um, conducting fieldwork in post-conflict contexts such as Georgia, Akbazia, Bosnia and Herzegovina. And her latest research was a multi-sided ethnography in different film markets and festivals, exploring film co-production networks and the process of Europeanization. She is now assistant professor at the Department of Balkan, Slavic and Oriental Studies at the University of Macedonia. And she will be talking to us today about from the Cold War ideology to the EU cultural policies, film co-productions in Southeast Europe. Eleni, the screen is yours. Thank you very much for having me here. Um, let me share my PowerPoint. I think you can see it now. Yeah? Yes. OK. So um, I will start with uh, my first narrative. It's from uh, Lila in her 60s, head of uh, Kinemateca from uh, Sarajevo. And um, we were discussing about film co-productions and uh, Lila expressed her puzzlement regarding what a co-production is. And she said, she came up with this statement that they were all Yugoslav films. We cannot talk about co-productions. So this, um, um, this puzzlement led me to my basic questions for today. So if the meaning of co-production, film co-productions fluctuated, what was uh, their significance during the Cold War period? What is the significance that they have today? And if there is any legacy from the Cold War uh, understanding to the co-production uh, meaning today? So um, as um, uh, I was, I was involved with this um, um, context of doing field work. Uh, as I was starting uh, in the 90s in Greece, uh, which was a period for my, for my, our academic world to, to get out from the ethnocentric and close to itself social anthropology. So the uh, very ethnocentric disciplinary boundaries in order to examine our neighbors with Eleni, uh, Eleni, sorry to interrupt you, but we can't see anything on your screen. So I was wondering if it's a, a blank slide, um, deliberate, no, or I, I can I can see and I can I, I get a message that you are screen sharing. We are, but we are not. We are okay. not seeing your screen. Uh, I, I, will, I will stop it and I will share it okay. again. Okay, I saw it briefly. Sorry about that. Yeah. Okay. Oh, it's appeared. Now we can see it. Yeah. Okay. Already? Okay. Sorry. <laughs> okay. Yeah. Okay. Let's hope it stays on. Um, so um, I'm starting for, with Lila's statement. And I was saying that I started my field work as an anthropology in the 90s when Greece and anthropology in Greece was about to go beyond borders and to explore um, as neighboring uh, worlds, the Balkan worlds, which were uh, until then forbidden due to the Cold War. My current field work, which I'm going to present was, as you said, decided in three festival cities and uh, uh, festivals and also film markets. 
and it was a comparative uh, ethnography. And uh, this comparison helped me challenge the one dimensional uniform perceptions of socialism post socialism through historicization and contextualization. So the exemplification in the last decades of the creative economy as the aging of the decaying urban economies in the EU since the 90s, even before that in countries like Britain, and the coming up of the globalization as uh, uh, the brave new world often made us believe that culture and cultural policies started with the 90s. But this is not the case. Cultures were, since the Cold War, the bridge between worlds and between societies especially in the field of uh, uh, film. We have film co-productions co since the late 50s and especially since the 60s. These co-productions were used to um, showcase cultural accomplishments, ideological accomplishments, but also to avoid uh, further militar the militarization of the world. So I'm using Shetney Samis, a social anthropology doing ethnography in Turkey and the Caucasus, idea of prehistory, to challenge this kind of newness attached to co-production and also the categorization of before and after in categories like socialism and post-socialism, and to explore this kind of pre-constructed stereotypes that we have attached to these categories. In the bibliography of the Cold War, there is a, a basic and fundamental division regarding film co-productions. There is a divide between the socialist co-productions, which were ideological motivated, and uh, the capitalist co-productions, which were capital investment oriented. But if we compare, and my study did that, different film industries in both blocks and also between them and also in varied combinations. So not only a socialist country and a, post and a capitalist country, but for example, comparing former Yugoslavia with the former USSR or Greece with the relation that the country had with the former Yugoslavia or with the former USSR, we get different results, more varied and diversified in terms of co-productions and why they happened. We get um, to, to, to understand the various motives, politics, the patterns and the, um, um, the partners and the networks formed. One of the issues that stands out is the issue of literal and symbolic proximity as an instigator of film co-productions. So unpacking this kind of proximity, the meaning of proximity, could help us understand why, for example, we had in the early uh, uh, days after the Second World War, a co-production between for the former Yugoslavia and the USSR here which is basically a circulation of know-how from the USSR to Yugoslavia, or this one with, with the USSR and India as an expansion of the uh, socialist recruitment, or here we have an, uh, one of the few uh, co-production between Greece and the former Yugoslavia as an undertake between two young creators that they were um, uh, ideologically uh, closed, or the breaches, the political breaches behind uh, the, uh, the co-productions. We have a series of films made as co-production between the, U uh, the former Yugoslavia and the US after the political breach between the Yugoslavia and the former USSR. So we have different stories that we have to explore before we can talk about uh, uh, why, uh, what motivated film co-production during the Cold War and what they meant for these people. So uh, 
Cooper, but Cooper Productions, since the 80s, became a big thing uh, for the EU as well. Why? Because it was the period that um, the EU tried to develop a systematic uh, interest to culture, to organize and institutionalize this field as part of a more coherent European identity, or at least an imagined coherent identity. In this framework, film festivals and film co-productions proliferated. The EU film funding became also a lifeline for national uh, film industries, especially for smaller uh, uh, cinematographies like Greece, or for countries coming out of the socialist context, like the countries from the former Yugoslavia or the former USSR, when they uh, became uh, uh, related and funded, eligible for funding from the EU mechanisms like uh, Eurimaz and media. The this kind of support mechanism like media, part of the creative culture today, supported, however, the formation of uh, a matrix of schools, training sessions, seminars for creators to learn how to get funding. So to, um, uh, to develop entrepreneurial skills, uh, to develop networking and not to give direct funding for film productions. So scarcity in funding, increased competition, it developed, uh, had an impact on the creators. And this brought me to my second narrative from a film director in Bosnia, but it is something that I got as an answer from different directors in different countries, in Georgia or in Greece as well. How do they cope with this kind of situation? How do they pick up their co-producers? And I to emphasize a word. He said that we are looking for chemistry. We are looking to have uh, a kind of chemistry with the people that we're meeting here in the festivals. But what is chemistry in the, cost, uh, in the context of the film market and for a creator? What does it mean? Chemistry is an emotion, I think, um, that I came up with my uh, research that combines cultural memory, practicality, instinct, but also uh, aesthetic compatibility. And why do I say that? These are the maps that I came up with that they represent the co-production networks that uh, uh, many of the creators that I uh, interviewed uh, form during their artistic uh, life. And also, uh, I, I combined it with a research into film databases and the, um, uh, the film co-productions done in these uh, countries, the three countries, since the 99, uh, since the 91 until 2016. So you can see we can, uh, we have in different colors, different cinematic neighbor, neighborhoods. For Antun, who was a Bosnian creator, the, his partners came mostly from the countries of the former Yugoslavia. So Croatia, Slovenia, but also Austria and Germany. These are the main partners in co-productions for Bosnia. Why? Because there, uh, as Atun said, he had people he used to know. He started his career during the last period of the former Yugoslavia. And he continued to work there because, uh, for example, the, the inclusion of Croatia and Slovenia in the US uh, member states helped them develop studios and infrastructure, a cash rebate system, and that gave these countries uh, an opportunity to develop a film industry. And that also helped neighboring countries like Bosnia to have partners from the same neighborhood. Also the same or similar language creates a compatibility for audiences and uh, uh, a privilege for uh, the mar marketability of the film. 
On the other hand, in Georgia, also coming out from a federal system, we don't see the same situation. Why? Because the neighboring countries of Georgia uh, don't have the same kind of film infrastructure, but also the Caucasus has many political uh, tensions still until, until, until today. So, for example, Russia, that could be a leading country as a film production partner, has um, a, a political animosity with Georgia for years. And Greece, on the other hand, because it was cut off from uh, its Balkan neighborhoods, only now during the economic crisis starts to develop cinematic relations with the Balkan countries. Until then, until now, Greece was a partnership, uh, doing partnerships uh, with uh, Germany, France, and Italy. So traditional big film industries. So my conclusion is that Exploring co-production help us understand the different motivation and the different stories that, that did not start with the 90s of the EU, but they have legacies and cultural memories coming from the Cold War. And help me explore uh, and understand the political engineering that turned culture as a force that would overcome barriers, penetrate borders, but also corroborate with visions like entrepreneurial arts, which is the paradigm for today. And in this context, to understand how creators adopt emotional and effective strategies to test the water, to measure the risk as they live in a risk uh, economy uh, situation before they go ahead with a co-production agreement. In this context as well, the term of prehistory helped me understand how lived experiences from the past and cultural memories from the past can be of value today. Thank you very much. Uh, you have to uh, switch on your microphone. Is not switched on? No. Ha! Huh. <laughs> I will reprimand our technical operations center after this panel. <laughs> okay, I'm joking. I will not. No, I'm not joking, I will. No. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you again, uh, Eleni, for such a wonderful talk. And uh, I already have a lot of questions in my head, but, and, but I'm sure that audiences will have a lot of questions too. And in order to leave time for all the great questions that will come along, let's go to another speaker, our second speaker, Katerina Preda. Uh, who is Associate Professor at the Department of Political Science at the University of Bucharest, where she teaches undergraduate courses on Latin American politics, art and politics, and cultural memory in South America and Eastern Europe. And her research is interdisciplinary and deals with art in dictatorships, artistic memory in post-dictatorships in South America and Eastern Europe, especially Chile and Romania. And today's talk, uh, is titled Trans-Regional Cultural Relations of the Second Socialist World During the Cold War. Katerina, the screen is yours. Thank you. And it's nice to see everybody here. It's 7 a.m. So I'm just wake, trying to stay awake, but hopefully I will make it and it will be at least a little bit interesting for our uh, common discussion. So I will read my presentation in order to make sure I am in time, uh, and so excuse me for that. Uh, my presentation analyzes from an interdisciplinary perspective that uses transregional cultural studies of the second socialist world, the unique example of the Chilean Museum of Solidarity and its relations with the socialist countries in Eastern Europe during the 70s and 80s. This case study helps explain the threads uniting countries of the second socialist world and the role of cultural relations as they were established during the Cold War between socialist countries in the South and the East. 
For some countries, such as Romania, cultural relations were important in establishing an autonomous policy from Moscow, such as that of Ceausescu. But the type of artistic exchanges promoted witnessed an aesthetic paradox, supporting a traditionalist nationalist version of art. Uh, from a theoretical point of view, I use Dragostinova and Fidelis perspective that argue for uh, an analysis of the role of East European socialist regimes from this perspective of the second uh, world of socialist countries that highlight their autonomy in relation to uh, the Soviet Union. The, through the two authors support the use of transnational methodologies that blend the cultural history approach with transnational history under the term of cultural transnationalism. This approach is similar to what Simo Mikonen and Pia Koivunen call cultural internationalism that consisted in the cross-national communication, understanding, and cooperation. This kind of perspective allows for a more in-depth study of East-South relations and of the different crossings between the Iron Curtain and into the Global South. Uh, my research also takes into account Piotr Piotrowski's concept of horizontal art history and his call to see the union between the marginalized East and the global South, as well as the discussion put forward by the artistic projects uh, in contemporary art, which engage with the transregional solidarity of artists during the later stages of the Cold War. The analysis examines the constellations of transregional relationships as mediated through institutional collaboration practices of the Cold War period through the case of Museo de la Solidaridad or Museum of Solidarity. At the same time, the case study chosen, uh, that of the relation with Romania, shows the limit of this model that emphasizes personal ties and not institutional context. I argue here in the line of Dragostinova that in order to understand how the autonomy of Eastern European countries from the Soviet Union functioned and how they use their cultural action as a strategy to establish their global presence, it is interesting to study cultural relations between the countries of the second socialist world, but at the same time, uh, relations between the socialist countries in the East and South are not uniform, but are examples that show how multi-layered practices interacted. As I said, in fact, the Romanian example is different than the other socialist countries. Uh, even if Ceausescu was considered as an uh, independent leader inside the bloc of Eastern European countries, at a closer look, it can be seen how the choices made in relation to this example elucidate his true stance on art. He used cultural means to strengthen his image, but the art promoted was traditionalist, nationalist, and not at all liberating. Um, the regime of Salvador Allende between 1970 and 1973 in Chile inaugurated the Chilean way to socialism that produced a series of important changes in Chile in just 1000 days of government that ended uh, abruptly with the military intervention of September the 11th, 1973. An important institution founded by the Allende regime was the Museum of Solidarity with a call to artists of the world to donate artworks for a museum of modern art for the people of Chile. This era is also known for the museum as the period of solidarity 1971 to 1973. Since 1975 and until 1990 in exile, it became the International Museum of um, Resistance, Salvador Allende, and this is known as the period of resistance. Thereafter, the Museum of Solidarity, Salvador Allende, reopened in Santiago de Chile, and this is how it looks now, uh, and is still active today and they have a really good website, so I invite you to see it. The museum remains to this date one of the most interesting examples of committed artists who collaborated to create a space for the popular classes to enjoy contemporary art. It was created as a museum against museums or an anti-museum that questioned their geopolitical monopoly by calling out the absolute incompatibility of their social function and the principles of the artworks and artists in their care. 
So it's a unique case study that can help us better understand the role played by the networks of intellectuals and artists in the movements of international solidarity. After the military intervention of September 1973, the museum, as I said, was reorganized in exile, starting with 1975, especially from Paris, but continued to collect artworks from artists and museums. Elodie Le Beau called this stage the Museum in Exile, while Carla Machiavello labeled it the Museum of Resistance, stressing the diversity of the collections in the different countries. In this stage, the museum was eminently transnational and thus represents a unique case in the manifestations of transnational solidarity with Chile. It was connected to the institutional sphere and to the political party apparatus of the countries where it implanted itself. Uh, so this uh, transnational institution was structured by national, national committees that were created in Cuba, Spain, France, and Mexico, which had a task to reunite artworks donated by artists who were in solidarity with the Chilean cause. For Le Beau, the committee were interrelated and not independent and their capacity to gather artworks depended on the countries in which it took place. So these artworks were exhibited in different venues during the military regime, from festivals to international solidarity events with a clear message against the dictatorship. Often murals were produced by the anti-fascist brigades formed by Chilean and Latin American artists with their European collaborators. Uh, so the Mirsa was founded uh, um, in Paris in 1975, the Museum in Exile, as a reaction to the establishment of the dictatorship in Chile and under the direction of those that created it in 1971 who were forced into exile. The role of the new museum was to denounce again the military dictatorship and to create new forms of solidarity. A new decentralized network of support was created and artists were invited, as I said, to donate their work with an explicit political objective, that of supporting the resistance. Thus, more than 1,000, 1,100 works were donated between 1976 and 1990, uh, and there were specific collections created in Cuba, Panama, Colombia, um, Mexico, and especially in Poland from the Eastern European countries. Um, and lastly, my last section refers to the Chilean-Romanian cultural relations. Cultural exchanges between Romania and Chile uh, were intermediated by the cultural relations section of the Ministry of Foreign Affairs, the Romanian Institute for Cultural Relations Abroad, the Ministry of Culture, and by creative unions such as the Union of Fine Arts, um, of fine artists, sorry. Besides these formal official institutions, there were also cultural associations between Romania and Chile. The Chilean Romanian Institute of Culture based in Santiago de Chile since 1952, and the Chile Friendship Association created in May 1973 in Bucharest. These two associations seem to be the result of the actions of individuals in the two countries that acted transregionally for the establishment of cultural relations between these two um, countries. Uh, if, we, uh, if we check the Museum of Solidarity retrospective album from which this map of the collaboration system of the museum is, um, is taken, under the title, The Lamentable Loss of the Romanian Shipment, uh, we can find a, a reference to Romania. Uh, that, uh, that says that according to documents from the Chilean embassy in Bucharest, there was a Romanian shipment also, which included paintings and sculptures donated by the Romanian government and artists. Um, on the Chilean side, there is no information concerning the arrival of the artworks, except for a receipt from, of transport from September 25, 1973, so immediately after the military intervention when the museum had been closed by the military. But even if this, even if this transport didn't arrive, it's interesting to, to see what Romanian sent. The Romanian National Archives have preserved a file that you can see here uh, in the Union of Fine Artists Fund entitled Donation to the Solidarity Museum of Chile of 1972, 
which includes the list of the six artworks that were sent with short bios of the artists. From the titles of the artworks, these were not openly propaganda art or politicized art at least, but they were uh, made by best known artists, members of the Union of Fine Artists, Corneliu Baba with a portrait, Alexandru Cucurengu with a landscape, Konstantin Piliuza, woman singer and so on. So we may surmise that Romania sent uh, these um, artworks with neutral themes and in the accompanying letter addressed to the Chilean ambassador in Bucharest, uh, it states that the Romanian artists, member, members of the Union of Artists, having learned about the call of the International Committee of Artistic Solidarity with Chile uh, for the creation of the art museum, decided to donate their artwork to this institution that would foster relations, blah, blah. As in other cases of donations for transregional exhibitions that have been documented, uh, we can in fact suppose the Union of Artists received the Chilean call for artworks and designated artists who would contribute. Uh, thus, uh, at the first glance, this would be another example of the bureaucratic, highly institutionalized um, Romanian artistic socialist field. Artists would not independently decide to support a certain cause, but would rather obey the hierarchical environment that was applied to the artistic world as well. So the Romanian example thus negates the logic of artists acting in solidarity with the cause put forward by the socialist, socialist artists of Chile and introduces the possibility of the institutionalization and politicization of the cultural field by the socialist state. So this approach also applies to the trans-regional cultural links, which although were the result of the action of certain individuals in Chile and respectively Romania, were thereafter taken over by this institutional logic. So in conclusion, based on this unused archival documents of the Institute of Cultural Relations and the Romanian Ministry of Foreign Affairs documenting the relation between Romania and Chile, I showed what was the bureaucratic perspective offered by the institutional archives. Uh, and as I said, although at the basis there were personal initiatives uh, and local initiatives uh, to have a, a cultural material to, to share, um, the types of events they organized were also part of this traditionalist approach of the cultural field, emphasizing expressions of popular art and not at all progressive art. Um, moreover, the donation to the Museum of Solidarity of Chile, which was lost uh, in the aftermath of the military coup in Chile, attests of this bureaucratic uh, logic. The Romanian sent artwork by important Romanian artists who, who, which were not at all ideological. And in fact, although the Ceausescu regime supported the arrival of 1,600 Chilean refugees in 1974 in Romania, the regime did not participate in the efforts to encourage the Chilean cause in the following years and did not collaborate with the museum in exile, the Mirsa, because this was openly against the dictatorship of Pinochet with whom Ceausescu maintained relations. So Ceausescu refused in his meetings with the leaders of the Chilean Communist Party to follow the line imposed by the party in exile in what concerns breaking the relations uh, with the Chilean um, dictatorship of Pinochet. So the Romanian case briefly shows that art considered in solidarity with the Chilean museum was, as I again said, traditional nationalist uh, and in agreement with Ceausescu's perspective on the arts and in stark opposition to the logic of art of resistance and solidarity that was collected um, from other Western countries. So if transregional and transnational studies discuss how individuals and networks of actors matter more than state relations, the establishment and consolidation of cultural relations between Chile and Romania confirms it, but the specific case um, of the relation between the museum and Romania, uh, we see that institutions uh, matter more. Um, so if the Museum of Solidarity represents a novel case study by studying its relation with the Romanian regime, what becomes evident is the difference in line with the reflections opened by D'Agostinova and Fidelis 
And so the many layers, in fact, of transregional cultural relations have to be taken into account. Thank you. Thank you, Katerina. Thank you for that uh, insightful and wonderful talk. And uh, a note to the audience, if you have any questions, you can type them in during the, during the talks and we will ask them in the, during the Q&A. Our next speaker is uh, Hui Chi Pan, who was recently awarded PhD in School of Communication at East uh, China Normal University. And her project focuses on the practice of film exhibition um, in Maoist China from 1949 to 1966, examining the mutual shaping process between film exhibition and politics. And she will be talking to us today about aesthetics, politics and internationalism, film weeks in China during the 17 years. Floor is yours. Floor or screen. <laughs> Uh, thank you. Uh, hello, uh, my um, the subject of my presentation is athletics, politics, and internationalism. Four weeks in China during the seventeen years. My presentation will be in three parts. Uh, firstly, I will. Um, briefly discuss the related work and the purpose of this study. Uh, few weeks in Chinese is Hian Ying Zhou, uh, can be seen as a competing alternative to the film festival. For example, the Southeast Asian Film Festival in 1954, which I will discuss later. And uh, during the 17 years, uh, a large number of film weeks were held in PRC to showcase the film cultures of other countries. On the other hand, PRC has also held Chinese film week in other countries, many Eastern Europe, Asia, and Africa. So film week served as a significant medium for cultural communication. Uh, my, uh, my research focused on Asian film Field Week, which continued as Asian Africa Field Festival, um, AAF short for, uh, and uh, combined with uh, China Iraq Field Week in 1958 um, to be further discussed. Uh, through this study, I want to present the complex relationship between political, uh, diplomatic relations, and cultural communication. Uh, in recent years, a number of studies have emerged to discuss a transnational communication of film between China and other countries. Um, this article uh, fo focuses on the Chinese Film Week participants in accumulating Chinese socialism and the PRC as a nation state. Ma Ran's arguments are very inspiring, but the reasons for the Film Week are too complex to be um, uh, to be summarized uh, simply as forceful program of cultural diplom diplomacy. And uh, as some uh, scholars have noticed that interactions within and uh, beyond the socialist bloc during the Cold War must be understood international. Uh, Jessica's research takes this one step further. She has noticed the link between nationalism and internationalism, but her study was based on reports about Chinese film journals. Due to the limitations of research documents, the stories behind these film weeks, which involved political and national dipl uh, diplomatic relations are not discussed in detail. So on um, the basis of these studies, my research is largely based on the study of archival documents and the newspaper. People's journey uh, content analysis was also used in the study, many focus on the thing and the uh, narrative structure of exhibited films. Uh, Asian Film Week uh, uh, was a response to Southeast Asian Film Festival in 1954. Uh, it renamed Asian Film Festival in 1957. Uh, 
uh, it uh, anti-communist uh, pro propaganda in Southeast Asia launched by Japan and the United States. Mm, the festival constructed an Asian collective identity that includes China and North Korea. A 1957 Taiwanese film, Yang Yuhu, was exhibited in the festival and uh, um, considered the worst in terms of art and technology, causing a stir in the Asian society. So in response, Beijing held Asian Film Week in August, uh, aimed to unite Asian for peace. Um, Non-socialist uh, uh, Asian countries were invited, for example, Japan, Singapore, uh, first exhibited uh, highlighted uh, the common interpoliticals among Asian countries. Uh, all of the films are realism. They um, present the suffering people's life. Uh, there is very little information, uh, information about the first festival in China. Uh, uh, in Tashkent, I couldn't find uh, any information about uh, the specific films on exhibit, but Chinese delegates uh, um, dropped the ideology of some films. They argued that uh, anti-colonial uh, films have to show everyday life of our peoples and uh, demonstrate that uh, we are not for asking for peace, but aim to achieve it through armed struggle. So during the third uh, uh, festival in, in 1964 in, in Indonesia, uh, it is a uh, um, cooperation and uh, the political task of film in the anti-imperialist and anti-colonial struggle is uh, um, clarified. Um, so uh, when Indonesia invited China to join the preparation of the festival, the third festival was held during the Indonesia Malaysia confrontation. And the US 17th fleet expanded its activities to the Indian Ocean to encircle Indonesia militarily. So during the festival, Indonesia launched a boycott campaign against Hollywood um, to a certain extent. Film Festival promoted the campaign to boycott the Hollywood in real life. Uh, four future films won the Bandu Award. Dirty Hands, Bowed the Cart, The Red Detachment of Women, Red Flower. Um, these three uh, films uh, present uh, the situation of women's life in Japan, China, North Korea. Uh, the, the fair in Japan is set in the first half of the 20th century. The woman lost her son, her daughter, and her husband during the Second World War. Uh, this, uh, this film is adapted for a real story, talk about a high school teacher, also a labor hero, and uh, the red detachment of women, or Hong Se Liang Zi Jun, tells the story of Xionghua's personal growth for a slave to a communist. Um, the women in the three films have different images and different lives. Women still lived in misery under Japanese military, while the socialist system liberated women in China and Korea. Um, through this comparison, successfully exported uh, the superiority of the socialist system. And uh, while I was looking through the archivals, I found during the second festival, Egyptian media reported uh, the screen of Chinese film is a big achievement, more significant than the Gojo Award, uh, because China engaged in a theoretical debate with the Nassau at that time. Um, and China held uh, China, uh, Iraq Film Week in 1958. Uh, to celebrate the first anniversary of the birth of the Republic of Iraq. Um, because uh, Iraq was established in 1957 under the revolution with the participation of the Communist Party, uh, Nasser sought to establish a unified Arab Republic based on the ideology of pan Arab nationalism. Nasser denied the legitimacy of the Republic of Iraq and attacked the communists in Iraq and uh, 
other countries. So in response, PRC recognized the legitimacy of the Republic of Iraq by holding a film week. Mm. You can see from this film weeks and our festivals, um, the imperialization and uh, decolonization was the main purpose of China to expand cultural communication during this period, rather than to argue with the sovereign reunion and establish its leading position in the third world countries. <clears throat> uh, yeah. Uh, uh, Due to, the, uh, due to the first festival information missing, I only find three, three future films presented at the Asian Africa Film Festival, Women Basketball, Player Number Five, Five Golden Flowers, and The, the Red Detachment of Women. There's three films, um, uh, <clears throat> these three films reflected a socialist athletic the three films share a common theme under the le leadership of the Com Communist Party of China, women won the right to choose a marriage, uh, love used to summon loyalty to the party and to uh, nationalism. Uh, through the discussion of the, these events, internationalism implies more than solidarity. It also had a revolutionary uh, significance. There are also rifts between uh, third world countries, for example, Egypt and PRC. Uh, Phil Weeks plays a dual role. The side of cultural struggle uh, as a political, political weapon. Uh, on the other hand, some political differences in Phil Week can also be set aside. Countries with conflicted ideologies can also be comprised. Mm, that is an I had to say. On. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you so much for that wonderful talk uh, and it's inspiring questions. We already have questions from audience coming in. Um, so that uh, let's speed up with the two last speakers so that we can open up for the exciting discussion. Really looking forward to that. Our next speaker is uh, Mayling Cruz, faculty member at the Department of Theory at the University of the Philippines College of Fine Arts, where she teaches Philippine art history. And her research interests include Philippine modern art and museum management. And today she will be talking to us about the Cold War and martial law dynamics in the art exhibitions of the Metropolitan Museum of Manila, from 1976 to 1986. Maylin, screen is yours. Thank you. Um, good day to everyone. I am Maylin Cruz from the University of the Philippines. The title of my presentation is Cold War and Martial Law Dynamics on Display Art Exhibitions at the Metropolitan Museum of Manila from 1976 to 1986. Uh, the exhibition is one of the key areas of operations of museums. Exhibitions communicate concepts, values, and knowledge to the museum audience. Exhibitions are one of the means by which museums render public service. Um, in this presentation, I will be examining the art exhibition program at the Metropolitan Museum of Manila as a dynamic site of Cold War cultural diplomacy in the martial law era Philippines. I will start with a useful Philippine timeline for context, then I will discuss the importance of the conflated patronage of the First Lady Imelda Marcos in the establishment and setting the direction, the international direction of the museum. I will then proceed with the examination of the museum's exhibitions and how they align with various state agendas in a climate of martial law and Cold War. And lastly, I will also surface the response of the museum audience, the Filipinos, um, to these things. For this study, I will be focusing on the period between 1976 to 1986, as this is the period where the Cold War, the imposition of martial law in the Philippines, and the operations of the Metropolitan Museum of Manila overlap. So in effect, we are also looking at the first 10 years of the museum. Here I present a simplified timeline just to give us all a better grasp of this time frame and the context. 
As a historical background, the Philippines was a colony of the United States from 1899 to 1946. So the post-war, the start of the Cold War, was also a significant time for the Philippines because it was when it was quote-unquote granted independence after being under the United States rule for about 48 years. We can also see in this timeline some relevant events in the Philippines in the context of the Cold War. The signing of the military basis agreement in 1947, then the declaration of martial law in 1972 were the official reason given by the Marcos government was supposedly to stem or to stop the growing insurrection and communist threat in the Philippines. In the 1970s, we also see the active pursuit of bilateral cultural agreements with socialist countries. Then in 1986, the Marcos regime was overthrown by a people power revolution. And finally, significantly in 1991, the dissolution of the Soviet Union, the end of the Cold War, and the termination of the military basis agreement between the Philippines and the United States. An important starting point in the examination of the entanglement of the Metropolitan Museum of Manila with, politi with politics in the state is the patronage of First Lady Imelda Marcos. In the first decade, the Metropolitan Museum of Manila, or the Met, as it is ordinarily called, operated under the leadership of the First Lady. She was the museum president for three years, from 1976 to 1979, and chairperson for 10 from 1976 until the Marcuses fall from power in 1986. In her incumbency, she occupied the highest position in the museum and was also its biggest patron. Mrs. Marcus moved within the traditional roles of the first ladies, that is social welfare and culture, but she was also a different first lady because she occupied numerous go government posts. She was, for example, the Minister of Human Settlements, which also made her chairman of the Economic Support Fund, Fund Council that administered the millions of aid from the United States government. She was also chairman or trustee of numerous government-owned corporations. Each of these posts came with the power of office and access, influence, and discretion over dispensing substantial government resources. She possessed a concentration of official power that was made even more potent by her personal power to sway her husband, the dictator president of the country. At the same time, she was a passionate dilettante and a voracious, voracious art collector who couldn't care about bureaucratic procedures and ethics. Mrs. Marcus's museum patronage can be more accurately described as a conflation of state support and the private art patron. In this mixed kind of um, patronage, state motives and private interests overlapped, aligned, and were simultaneously pursued. The Met was created by, by virtue of an office memo issued by Mrs. Marcos as a chairman of another cultural agency, the Cultural Center of the Philippines. She instructed the CCP president to organize and administer a Metropolitan Museum of Art in order to, quote, broaden the Filipino people's awareness of the cultures of the world and to provide them with the opportunity of viewing international art in original form. Looking at the dates, the order was to create a museum in a little over a month. The, the museum was officially opened on October 3, 1976. When the first lady, with the first lady as the primary patron, the Met became deeply entangled with state agenda domestically and internationally. The Met's main source of exhibitions during the time of Mrs. Marcos were created and curated traveling art exhibitions brought to the country by diplomatic missions, more commonly known as embassy exhibits. Cultural exchange exhibitions strengthen the, and display robust diplomatic relations and this was of great importance to the dictatorial government of President Marcos that was persistently hounded by questions of legitimacy. The greatest number of exhibitions at the Met during the Marcos era came from the United States, 16 out of the 99. 
the exhibitions cut across a wide variety of spectrum from traditional fine arts to photography, to tapestry, to ceramics, to fashion, from the survey type to artists' collective shows, to exhibits headlined by world famous names such as Helen Frankenthaler, Roy Lichtenstein, Clay Oldenburg, James Rosenquist, and Andy Warhol. For the US, the exhibitions were an easy and relatively inexpensive way of exporting its cultural products and propagating its American values to its former colony at the end of the uh, in the era of Cold War. Majority of the exhibitions at the Met were coordinated with the cultural office of the United States Embassy in Manila, acting as conduit for the United States Information Agent, Agency or UCIA, USIA, which, is, which was later known as um, United States International Communication Agency or USICA. It was um, described by Mulcahy bluntly as a public relations agency of America abroad. Exhibitions of pop artists like Warhol were favored by the agency since their notoriously eclectic artistic practice promoted an image of America as defender of freedom and arbiter of international culture. A significant number of exhibitions at the Met also featured art from socialist and communist countries, six from the USSR, four from Yugoslavia, two from Czechoslovakia, and one from China. For the socialist countries, these exhibits were opportunities to introduce their culture and values to a people widely perceived to be ideologically aligned to the United States. The exhibits were also used to commemorate and spread awareness, awareness about the socialist country's political histories. Among the events celebrated through the Met exhibits were the 40th anniversary of the proclamation of the Yugoslavian Republic, the 68th anniversary of the Great October Socialist Revolution, and the 40th anniversary of the liberation of Czechoslovakia from the fascist occupation. Special mention should also be made regarding the inaugural exhibit at the Met, which also featured foreign art, American and European to be exact, but not a canned embassy show. The, impetu the impetus for the Met's inaugural show and the creation of the museum itself was the Philippines hosting of the joint annual meeting of the governors of the IMF World Bank in 1976. The Philippines' major foreign ally was the United States and the inauguration of the Met reveals a great number of alignments with its politics, culture, and ideals. The very name of the museum, the Metropolitan Museum of Manila, not only implies the big city aspiration of Manila, but also suggests a connection to the other Met, the Metropolitan Museum of Art in New York. Its modern art focus also emulates another American museum, the Museum of Modern Art. The consultants hired by Mrs. Marcos to put together the inaugural show were also Americans. The New York art patroness and Brooklyn Museum Governor Lillian Berkman and former director of Art Institute of Chicago, Alan McNabb. All but three of the artworks exhibited were loaned from American collectors. Importantly, even without any clear curatorial collect connection, the inaugural show was generous, generously built in commemoration of the American Bicentennial. The political message sent to the U.S. government via the Met was one of submission to superiority, a message necessary for the Marcos regime because of its extreme dependence on U.S. military and economic aid. The American sounding and the American styled Met in Marcos land signaled to the United States that the ruler and its country is a loyal political ally adhering to American symbols and values. The political and ideological usefulness of the inaugural exhibit at the Met is also confirmed by the U.S. side, which of course was pursuing its own interests. In a series of declassified cablegram correspondences between the U.S. Embassy in Manila and the Department of State, Ambassador William Sullivan happily reported to, reported to Secretary Henry Kissinger that the exhibit garnered for the United States, quote, maximum cultural windfall with enthusiastic audience and media reaction from a very modest official investment. He noted the important contributions of Bergman and McNabb, 
together with pianist Van Clyburn, who performed at the Cultural Center of the Philippines, towards, quote, highly favorable public opinion impact for the United States. Sullivan and Kissinger agreed that the three Americans deserved official recognition and appreciation from the United States government. The Cold War at the Met was not without the cal calculated permission of the venue host, the, Ma the Marcos regime. Despite citing communist rebellion as a pretext to declaring martial law, President Marcos ironically revoked the previous administration's anti-communist stance and opened diplomatic and cultural relations with countries such as the USSR and China. Many of the bilateral cultural agreements with the communists and socialist countries were negotiated and signed by the first lady herself. These were gestures, according to Mrs. Marcos, to form new friends with other countries while not abandoning old ones. President Marcos also said, we feel that we feel it unhealthy for a country to deal only with part of the world when it poses as a modern and progressive country. He said that we cannot close our eyes to the 800 million people of mainland China, nor the 200 million people of Russia. More than a desire for peaceful coexistence and cultural understanding, scholars note that the foreign relations with communist states articulated in the museum through embassy exhibitions were quote, survival strategies of the Marcos regime to secure reciprocal nods to the legitimacy of its rule, expand ex economic horizons, and combat local economic worries, such as securing alternative suppliers of oil in times of crisis and, address and addressing the shrinking export market. Scholars also point out that the openness of the commu to communist countries was a tactic by the Marcos regime to leverage more economic support from the Philippines ally and the USSR's worst enemy, the United States. The Met, as demonstrated by its foreign exhibitions, was a site to pursue multiple economic, cultural, and political agendas and nurture numerous state alliances. These motives and alliances variably align, overlap, and contradict in the dynamic fractured field of the museum dispositive. The question now is how successful were the Marcos government and its partner states in pushing their agenda to the local Filipino audience? The museum's archives provide some insights. The inaugural show, which ran for 26 days, was seen by an audience of 20, about more than 26,000 and was one of the museum's well-attended exhibitions. However, this number is marginal compared to the very large population it could have reached. In spite of the free admission and being open seven days a week, the museum was barely drawing people in. Worth noting too is the profile of the museum audience, which consisted mostly of students on field trips and members of the art community and foreign visitors. It appears that the civilizing and modernizing thrust of the museum was barely felt by the masses who mostly ignored the space. There were also disconnections and resistances against the setting the art of other cultures, cultures as bench, benchmark for modernity and excellence. For one, the expressed international focus of the Met did not stop visitors from wanting to see Philippine art at the museum more than foreign art. There were also remarks that the artworks on view were, quote, beautiful, and quote, nice, but cannot be understood. Significantly, there were museum goers who were clearly not impressed, remarking that the foreign artworks were at most okay, but Filipino artists are better and can equal their output and variety. From this angle, the exhibits appear to be more relevant for the states and Mrs. Marcus's caprices rather than to the Filipino audience. This ends my presentation. Thank you. Great. Um, thank you, Maylin, for that very insightful, wonderful talk. And I'm sad that we have approached the final speaker, not because of the final speaker, but one reason because I've just realized where the camera is. <laughs> I haven't been looking into camera, sorry about that. But most importantly, because I'm realizing and appreciating how much diversity, uh, how much underrepresented uh, 
uh, epistemology, knowledges of practices and ideas we have brought uh, together today in this panel. And it's so precious to see these different perspectives and insights coming together in such a wonderful way, speaking across border, which is across national borders, which is precisely what transnationalism is about. So we will uh, have our final speaker in this panel, third panel of today, and that would be Agata Pietrasik, who is art historian with interests in post-war modernism in Europe, representations of the Holocaust and World War II in the visual arts, currently working on the project How Exhibitions Rebuilt Europe, exhibiting war crimes in the 1940s as part of the Getty ACLS postdoctoral fellowship in the history of art. And she is also an author of the book, uh, Art in a Disrupted World, Poland, 1939 to 1949, published this year. So we have not only great presentations today, but we have also a lot of interesting work uh, coming out that um, if audience is more interested in these themes can read. And her presentation today will be about where does abstract art belong? The meanings of abstract art beyond the Iron Curtain. Agatha, the screen is yours. Thank you. Thank you very much for this kind introduction. Um, the narrative which connects the emergence of modernist and abstract art in 20th century uh, with political freedoms available uh, exclusively to the citizens of Western democracies constitutes one of the longest lasting interpretations stemming directly from the Cold War period. In my paper, I would like to cast light on the existence and mode of, uh, modes of dissemination of modernism in the countries of the Eastern Bloc using Poland as my primary example. I also would like to consider how the international presence of abstract and non-figurative art from the so-called East can be conceptualized beyond uh, the firmly established dichotomy of socialist realist art versus abstraction. I will focus on the late 1950s and bring to your attention in particular exhibitions of modernist art from Poland organized at the time in the West. Uh, firstly, however, I would like to provide some context regarding the development of the visual arts in the early post-war years of uh, People's Republic of Poland. In the immediate post-war period, the establishment of uh, communist rule was met with uh, certain enthusiasm uh, among the artists who were previously connected to avant-garde movements that had usually aligned politically with the left. The new government was imposed as a result of global geopolitical shifts rather than grassroots movements, and was therefore eager to seek support among artists and intellectuals. Already in 1944, it was officially declared that people of science and culture were to be under the special care of the new government. This government was also strongly invested in bringing art to the working class. And you can see here this on the image on the left. This postulate resonated very strongly uh, with numerous artists and intellectuals, even those otherwise hostile to the communist agenda. Consequently, the issue of disseminating culture became one of the most debated themes of the post-war moment in Poland, as indeed elsewhere. Uh, this resulted in an increased investment in cultural infrastructure, uh, in creating traveling exhibitions uh, that were organized to tour small cities and villages, uh, and in building so-called palaces of culture, which were set up in areas previously uh, disconnected from any kind of cultural life. Uh, also newly nationalized manors uh, and aristocratic estate were repurposed for museums and so on. However, by the end of the 1940s, uh, the state expectations toward artists were expressed in increasingly authoritarian language. Uh, the avant-garde and modernist art was deemed bourgeois and cosmopolitan. Socialist realism fashioned after the Soviet model was conceived as the only art suitable for the masses and the state controlled institutions stopped exhibiting any kind of non-figurative art. There are two events in particular that came to symbolize this shift. 
One is the demolition of the neoplastic room, which we, you can see now. It was created in 1948 by the Polish avant-garde pioneer Władysław Strzemiński in the Museum Sztuki in Łódź in order to display um, the sculptures of Katarzyna Kobra as well as his own abstract paintings. The room was emptied and painted over in 1950. Uh, the second symbolic event uh, also is the first exhibition of modern art organized in Kraków in 1948. This exhibition brought together artists connected to the pre-war avant-garde with the artists of younger generation. Together, they were trying to articulate a new type of modern art that would express the new reality of post-war Poland and be truly accessible to all viewers. This event is often seen as both the high point and swan song of post-war modernism in Poland. The period that followed between 1949 and 1955 was a period of socialist realism in all fields of art. This time uh, is only now beginning to be critically assessed and studied in a nuanced way. The death of Stalin in 1953 is usually seen as the catalyst for change in cultural politics alongside other fields. Um, and the mid to late 1950s are considered a period of artistic richness and flourishing in modern art. And you can see this opening here being so clearly demonstrated by a, a cover of a popular magazine. Uh, this short introduction allows me to move to what is the core of my presentation, namely the international presence of Polish modern art in Western countries in the late 1950s. This phenomenon was given many names. In Germany, it was called the Polnische Welle, and in French, Vague Polonaise. The enormous interest in Polish modern art was not limited to contemporary art, but also concerned the pre-war avant-garde. Showing contemporary artists side by side with avant-garde precursors was a strategy used by many curators. It strengthened the position of the contemporary artists and made it clear that modern art had its own genealogy and was not, as some claimed, an import from abroad. For example, uh, in 1957, the Parisian gallery Denis René organized an exhibition titled Pioneers of Abstract Art in Poland, which displayed the works of the aforementioned Strzemiński Kobro alongside Henryk Berlewi. This exhibition reclaimed the historical uh, artists for contemporaneity, and their practice was retroactively used to create a lineage for new emerging artistic trends such as opart, a movement that was particularly favored by Denise René herself. Interestingly enough, one of these early pioneers, uh, Henrik Berlevi, returned to his artistic practice shortly after the exhibition and became one of the recognized proponents of opart thereafter. Several years later, in 1966, his works were included in the famous MoMA exhibition, The Responsive Eye. Returning to the eventful year of 1959, one of the most popular Polish journals on culture, Życie Literackie, Literally Life, excitedly reported, quote, an international offensive of Polish art, end of quote. The article listed all the international successes of Polish artists testifying to the change of official line of the Polish government. Modern art became a source of national pride the militaristic metaphors, as well as the use of language usually encountered in sports commentar uh, commentary, are thus non-coincidental. The end of the 1950s and the early 1960s was a true moment of internalization for Polish art. And now I will list shortly just a few of the most significant events. In 1958, the Polish pavilion causes a huge controversy at the International Exhibition of Fine Arts of socialist countries held in Moscow. Even the paintings of an officially established artist, Saveri Dunikowski, which you can see now on the left, um, were judged to depart too much from the accepted line of realism. This exhibition uh, also featured abstract paintings by Adam Marczyński, whose work was also displayed in the quite antithetical Documenta II in Castle in that same year. And on the right, you can see the work that was presented uh, at the Documenta in Castle. Uh, in 1959, Willem Sandberg organized an exhibition titled Polish Painting from Today, which displayed the most uh, renowned members of the Polish avant-garde um, in the Distadelic Museum in Amsterdam. 
Uh, it also included uh, works of younger artists such as Andrzej Wróblewski, whose work that was on display in the study, like you can see on the right, um, and Jerzy Nowosielski. In the same year, uh, also in the study, like a designer and architect Stanisław Zamecznik and painter Wojciech Fangor created a very early example of environmental art uh, titled Color in Space. And he's the historic uh, photographs and um, images of uh, reconstruction of this exhibition. Um, also in 1959, Poland sent a very strong representation of young artists to the first Paris Biennial. It included some of the most promising painters of the new generation, Jan Lebenstein, Jan Tarasin, Stefan Gierowski, and Teresa Pongowska, as well as the sculptor Alina Szapocznikow. Lebenstein won the Grand Prix of the Biennial, uh, an event which launched his international career and led to many solo exhibitions throughout Europe and US. Uh, in 1961, MoMA organized an exhibition titled 15 Polish Painters uh, as a large presentation of young painters, also Lebenstein among them, but uh, uh, Tadeusz Kantor and Wojciech Fanger as well. And that same year, 1961, the Polish Pavilion at the Sao Paulo Biennial, curated by Richard Stanisławski, enjoyed wide recognition and graphic artist Tadeusz Kulisiewicz, whose work you can see now, was aw awarded the Grand Prix. Um, this, is, uh, this list is only a general overview of few selected events. It brings to the four group shows, which were organized with some involvement of official Polish state organizations, such as the Office of International Cooperation. Apart from such events, there were many other solo exhibitions of Polish artists organized by private galleries in Europe and the US, independently from the structures. A separate but equally significant chapter of this internalization was written in the history of Polish architecture. This is a topic uh, for another presentation probably, but Polish exhibition pavilions such as this one designed by Oskar Hansen for the Sao Paulo Biennial in 59, why, uh, were another way of engaging in global discussions about modernism. Um, art historians, among them Piotr Piotrowski, have pointed out that these exhibitions were a tool of cultural diplomacy, allowing the People's Republic of Poland to present a more modern side of an otherwise oppressive regime. This would mean that officials managed to co-opt the Western narrative about an inherent connection between political and artistic freedom for their own benefit. At the same time, when we look at those who shaped the exhibitions, it becomes apparent that the people involved, involved uh, had strong connections to the pre-war avant-garde and or contemporary art. It is therefore difficult to see the exhibitions as simply top-down projects designed for the sake of diplomacy. They are also evidence of a continuity of engagement in modernism that survived the disruptions of war, uh, of war and socialist realism. At the same time, there was also a discrepancy between the projected image of Poland and the reality at home. Commenting on the internalization of Polish art in the late 1950s, one of the top, top cultural journals reported, quote, while in our homeland, local modern art is still not widely known and enjoys a mixed reputation in a narrow circle of art enthusiasts, it is an indisputable fact that there is a growing interest in Polish painting, graphic and sculpture coming from abroad, end of quote. Studying the reception of the aforementioned exhibitions points out uh, not only towards the paradoxes of the art world in Eastern European countries, it also raises the question of what drove an interest in Polish modern art in the West. Uh, the very existence of European abstract art was often used as a uh, remedy, uh, was often used to remedy the crisis of abstraction and validate it further as a truly universal mode of expression. At the same time, a perceived lack of visible difference uh, in style between Eastern and Western abstract and modern art constituted a source of anxiety. One Dutch newspaper noted on the occasion of the 1959 Stadelike exhibition, quote, the quietly decorated atmospheric exhibition of work of 16 selected Polish painters is not Polish, but international of appearance and could at first sight be an exhibition from any other Western country, end of quote. This sense of commonality of language led the curator Willem Sandberg to state during the opening, 
Um, another quote, there is no iron curtain between our art and Polish art, end of quote. In a way, Polish modern art constituted a perfect other, one in which Western modernism could be reaffirmed as universal. To briefly sum up, the emergence of abstract art as global phenomena connecting the two sides of the iron curtain was a distinctive characteristic of the late 1950s. To study this phenomena opens many questions about exchange, collaboration, the nationalism of internationalism, the crisis of non-representational art, and so on, and allows for a more critical understanding of dominant narratives about culture during that time. Thank you very much. Wonderful. Thank you, Agatha, and thank you to all the speakers in today's panel for giving us such wonderful, insightful talks. And we are now opening our Q&A session while we are preparing. And please, uh, the audience and also speakers, uh, if you want to ask a question, uh, you can ask in person or you can, uh, well, virtually in person, or you can type it into the chat box. And as, as we are preparing the questions, uh, allow me to just briefly um, reiterate how precious this sharing I felt was in the way that uh, it turns transnationalism into methodology for a new kind of perspective um, into a particular historical period, which we have, and that is the Cold Wars, which have been defined by geographical and political uh, borders, relations, and also uh, nation states and communication between nation states. But all the talks today, both in the first and second panel, use transnationalism to go beyond uh, the, the institutional and the, and the nation states and to show these connections, maps, and networks between people across borders and in itself, by doing so, by choosing transnationalism as a methodology, dismantling the Cold War narrative, which firmly rests on geographical and political delineations and structures. And interestingly, what we have seen and heard in all the talks is a new kind of map. We had two speakers using maps uh, to show uh, these um, transnational connections and all, all in all talks, very applicable. And I was thinking about how we can imagine a different kind of map of the world by using such approaches that we have seen in the, in the talks today. And interestingly, how you can use film co-productions, archives, museums, and film festivals as the nodes in these transnational networks. So thank you, thank you to all the speakers again for their wonderful insights. Uh, I enjoy them very much. And um, we have one question, please, uh, to begin with, please uh, do type in um, your questions. The question is from Li Guo asking Dr. Huichi Pan, can you tell more about the Soviet Union in the third Asian African Film Festival? Thank you. Uh, okay, thank you. Uh, uh, the Soviet Union uh, was in uh, my general position um, uh, during the uh, third festival. Uh, um, um, uh, representatives of various countries gathered in Indonesia to attend the uh, popularity uh, meeting of the second uh, Asian Africa conference. Uh, the meeting was many solved an important question uh, whether the Soviet Union is an Asian country and uh, uh, whether the um, whether the Seventh Union is qualified to participate in the Asian Africa Conference. So, uh, in this political background, um, and the Seventh Union ex uh, only exhibited one film, uh, Children of uh, um, Children of Pazmil, uh, uh, Children of Pamils. In the Indonesian media, have criticized uh, um, the film's contact and uh, theme. Uh, argues it promotes uh, 
on uh, on principled peace and uh, 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 it against the anti-imperialist purpose of the uh, festival. Yeah, so uh, it uh, it was in a marginal position. Yeah, that's all. Okay, thank you. I hope that answers the question. Do we have questions coming up? Or may I then ask a question? <laughs> ah, see, as, as soon as I mention asking a question, <laughs> we have questions coming up. No, that's, that's great. <laughs> I'm joking, but I feel a bit sabotaged here by the audience. <laughs> Okay, question for Agatha. You mentioned that Polish art became the perfect other so that the West could legitimate itself via abstract art. How did the images of Auschwitz and the Holocaust complicate this? Uh, thank you for this question. Um, I think it's, um, yeah, it's a, it's a really good one. Um, uh, in case that I showed in my presentation of the paintings of Dunikowski, this, um, the images of Auschwitz, they were um, quite visible and also included in the title. And he was one of the most, I would say, official Polish artists at that time. Um, and also a survival of, of the camps, so it was like also his personal story. Um, and he was working more with this kind of different styles of figurations. Um, and his art was not so much exhibited in Western countries. It was rather shown uh, in Poland or in that exhibition specifically in, in Moscow. Uh, and in Poland, it was considered completely non-controversial, non, non I would say, but as soon as it traveled to Moscow, it kind of created this um, debate. Um, I think the question of the depiction of the uh, Holocaust in Auschwitz um, came in a much more nuanced way in the Western exhibition. So, for example, we know that um, in the works of Alina Shapochnikov, this was um, something that was very palpable, but I think in a much more nuanced way. So if the viewers themselves were not somehow sensitive to those topics, uh, I think they could be not seen by them. So maybe. Um, that is a good answer. It does kind of complicate, but it also depends who was looking at the at the art. Um, yeah. Thank you. And uh, don't turn off your microphone yet. We have another question for you. <laughs> Did the Polish abstract art encounter political pressure later? In what ways and when did it happen? Yes, so uh, thank you. I didn't, didn't have a chance to mention it, but yes, there was this moment uh, in the late uh, in the kind of mid 60s where things started to return to a kind of more conservative discourse on art there was even a law uh, introduced um, that there is only uh, the, the amount of abstract art shown on exhibitions can be only 10 percent but nobody really knows if this law was actually um, observed I, I think it's more um, rhetoric than, than, than curatorial practice so yes, the things have definitely changed uh, in the mid 60s. Uh, and this kind of modern art was again criticized as kind of being um, a commodity being connected to commercialism to to kind of Western ideology and so on. But things never uh, returned to the kind of level of control of the artistic scene that we have seen in the 1950s. Thank you. Um... Do we have more questions? Do sabotage me, please, and ask more questions. <laughs> uh -huh. Somebody's going to sabotage me? Great. OK, uh, we have a question uh, that goes to Mei Lin. Even though both the US and Soviet Union employed their arts as tools of cultural diplomacy in the Philippines, I wonder why the exhibitions failed to resonate with the Filipino public as much as they did with the government at that time. Could it be that these exhibitions were more for institutional recognition than for public acceptance? Yeah, uh, for the U.S. Um, exhibitions were um, based on the feedback 
from the archives that are um, to the exhibits um, in the museum's archives, the U.S. Um, exhibitions had more response. The Filipino public was were more responsive to it, but the responses were either very good, very positive, or also very negative. That you know, it wasn't impressive to them. With regard to the Soviet Union, I think. Uh, it seems to me that um, the, their strength in cultural diplomacy was not really in the visual arts, but they were more effective in uh, performance arts. Um, like um, they would bring in um, ballet groups and um, perform performers. So in that field, but not particularly in the, the visual arts were kind of, um, the, the response was very um, weak um, in terms of the visual arts. Thank you. More questions? Interesting questions, interesting talks. I have a question for Katerina. Great. Hi, Katerina, thank you very Hi. much for your paper. Um, you. I would like to ask you um, if there is an input left from these um, transregional networks, for example, if there are, there is a a legacy and impact in the relation between Romanian and Chilean artists today, or are these transnational uh, networks, as you described, them, more formed from above, from institutions, or from uh, the foreign, uh, uh, the Ministry of Foreign Affairs, or something like that? Do you have interaction between artists that they form these uh, networks and they they created um, a tradition of uh, collaboration? Unfortunately, I don't know. Thank you for the question. But um, what I do know is that there were a lot of Chileans that were welcomed in Romania by Ceausescu. And this is a topic that has not at all been researched. And some of them were artists. And some of them uh, were uh, studying here in the film and theater faculty in Cluj and in Bucharest. And so some of them may have become film directors with this within this tradition, but I don't know uh, because this was, I, I heard this like two weeks ago, I gave a talk and uh, uh, there was this film critic and she told me, I remember when the Chileans came and they were in the hall of the faculty and they were uh, registering to become students, you know? Other than that, um, I think it's mostly, so other than this political connection that brought Chileans to Romania and they stayed here for a while, but most of them left because discovering real socialism <laughs> was kind of too much. And so they emigrated to, to Sweden mostly. Um, uh, so I, I, I'm not sure there were true collaborations. This, is, this was a, a little bit my point that it was mostly political level besides this uh, welcoming of exiles who were communists uh, and, and had to flee Chile, right? So I'm, I'm sorry, I don't know, but I think it could be. It just needs to be researched. Yeah. Great, thank you. Do we have more questions? Speakers also welcome, as well as- I also have a question for Maylin, if it's possible. Great, great, please go ahead. So thank you for the wonderful talk. And I was wondering because you showed that a little at, at some point, the list of the uh, bi bilateral cultural agreements with socialist countries. And mm -hmm. uh, the USSR was among the last ones, right? And so it was an interesting example, 1974 Czechoslovakia, 1975. Uh, and I was wondering if you have more details on how these kind of connections were made. Were there personal connections of the leader and uh, Imelda? So they were traveling to socialist uh, Europe and they were meeting and then signing the agreements or, or which is the reason? Because it's really interesting. Um, you have to keep in mind that the Philippines was, um, as, uh, was allied to the United States. It was a former <laughs> colonial master. So there was constant um, strategizing that was going on. So even before, even though the the formal um, cultural agreement was um, signed later in 1978, 
prior to that, there were informal um, exchanges, but there was the, the Marcos government tried to delay the formal signing as it was constantly trying you know, to negotiate for better terms from both the US and the, um, and the Soviet um, and socialist countries. It's very interesting actually. Um, the, it's also something that um, um, needs a lot of research, but there are materials um, out there that can be studied. Yeah, it's really interesting. Hey, we have a question for Eleni. In your data map, you show that contemporary Bosnia co-productions are often with Austria. Is this a legacy of the Habsburg Empire that reappears only after the period of Yugoslavia, for, for example, after Cold War? Yes, um, I think I, 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 I wouldn't give a, a definite positive answer if it's a legacy of the Habsburg Empire, but it was the the emergence of the EU funded co-productions coincided with the uh, process of enlargement for the EU. So this process was lead, uh, the leaders of this process was Germany and Austria. Austria was the newly, uh, the new member of the uh, EU back then, and they wanted to be one of the leaders supported by Germany. So they considered the former Yugoslav world as a, their vital space. That's why Austria in the first uh, five to 10 years of the film called productions in Bosnia is one of the leaders. Even now, for example, the, uh, the last uh, big uh, movie that came out for, from Bosnia, um, Jasmila's Banit's film, Quo uh, Vadis uh, Austria is one of the co-producers. So it was part of this foreign policy to lead, to play a role in the new European uh, Union space. Okay, great. Any last question before we close today's session? Well, at least this third I, I, panel. I, 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 I have a question for uh, Hui Chi. Mm -hmm. Please go ahead. Yes. yes. Um, uh, do you have a call? Can you elaborate on the reception of the audiences during these film weeks? Who, who attended? What were the reception of the films? Um, the film so weeks. About the, the, the audiences of the festivals. Who attended the festivals? Uh, the difference between film weeks and the film festival. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Oh, okay. Uh, and the um uh, the festival uh, the film weeks uh, uh, basically uh, built on a uh, agreement uh, 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 cultural agreements according to equality for example uh china ha held the iraq film week in 1958 and uh, iraq held the chinese film week in 1962 based on a cultural agreement and uh, uh, at that time china uh, has a negative attitude to film festival uh, in 1916 uh, in uh, i forget the exactly time uh, the magazine issued uh, article said uh, uh, the film festival has uh, has been a fascination so um, so um, at that time China uh, has a, a negative attitude toward the film festival yeah uh, so uh, uh, China uh, tended to held uh, film weeks uh, uh, with other countries uh, according to sign the cultural agreements according to equal, equality, yeah. If I can follow up on that, uh, Eleni's question, or that is Eleni's question, the people who came to see the films, was it open to everyone to come and see the films? The film festivals, Hui Chi, were they open to everyone? Uh, a film festival. Uh, uh, so sorry, I, I'm. Uh, uh, can you please repeat the question? 
the film festivals, the, when they were screening the films, could yeah. anyone attend? Anybody could, could come and see the films? Were the audience ordinary people? Uh, yeah, yeah. Uh, it, it, it usually uh, it, it usually held in cities, and uh, uh, um, the students, the farmer, are uh, are required to attend the film festival to uh, watch the movies. Yeah. And they are required oh, to buy a yeah. <laughs> Sorry, when you said required, I was like, first when you started saying farmers and peasants, I was like, yes, that's great, people engaging. And then the other like required, oh, shit. <laughs> But uh, yes, uh, still the impact, it would be wonderful to, to hear more about the impact. Unfortunately, we have to close our panel. Uh, it's been such an amazing panel and thank you so much to everyone. Um, to Eleni, to Katerina, uh, to Huichi, to Maylene and to Agatha, thank you so much for joining us for today's um, conference, for today's panel. And I hope uh, we'll keep in touch and exchange our ideas. And thank you also to all the audience, to participants, uh, everyone who asked questions. And huge uh, thank you goes to our technical support, mostly students who are working hard and therefore they will not be reprimanded after the panel. <laughs> So no students were harmed during the filming of this panel. <laughs> okay, uh, thank you everyone so much again. It's been such a privilege and pleasure to chair the panel and uh, join us for the later. Thank you, Jonas, for the later panel. And also for those of you joining us for the graduate students uh, sessions tomorrow, you will find me there as well. And I'm sure we'll have Saturday. Sorry, Saturday. I thought it was Friday today. Okay, <laughs> not, yet, not yet. Sorry. So on Saturday, we have graduate student sessions, and which I'm sure will be mind blowing as well. So join us for that. Thank you very much, everyone. Have a good day. Thank you, Thank you very much.